have noticed over the last day and a half that mental health has been extremely richly represented in this uh, two-day event on adolescent health, and I'm particularly very delighted. I remember uh, 25 years ago when I began working in this sector, I would be laughed out of a room if I spoke about mental health in a meeting on adolescent health. The focus, as we saw earlier today, was almost entirely on reproductive and sexual health. And I think as someone remarked um, in the morning, uh, these divisions are completely artificial because for young people, from their perspectives, their reproductive and sexual health and their mental health are inseparable. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting how often we've siloed young people's health, reflecting our own specialist prisms, rather than actually what young people themselves perceive uh, as the interconnectedness of various aspects of their well-being. So I'm delighted you've been able to come for this, uh, I think, uh, very important discussion on a particular set of vulnerabilities that some young people face uh, that might impair their mental health and also impair their ability to access services, uh, both for prevention as well as for treatment and care for mental health problems. And I'm delighted that today we'll be joined by two uh, panelists who will be referring to their own work um, in two completely different contexts. Uh, and I should say something about that. Uh, I find it very curious that when we talk of global health, we're really referring to some other part of the world. Um, and I'm really delighted that CanWatch has really uh, uh, recognized that the global is local um, first, uh, and that inequalities in health, uh, in particular mental health, uh, are actually global phenomena in all countries. So I'm particularly thrilled that one of the two panelists today is in fact from Canada. And we'll be speaking uh, Mike Rilieu, uh, who's a physician who is unfortunately not physically with us, but the reason is he's out there, I think, with his community where he actually works. Uh, so there's Mike. Mike, I'm assuming you're out there uh, uh, with the community that you work in? Yes, yeah. Okay. All right, Mike. Uh, well, welcome uh, by video conferencing. This is another wonderful new development. I should think of it the next time I get invited. Uh, uh, but uh, Mike, welcome to this, uh, to this session. In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to just say a few words about yourself and then uh, to elaborate more about um, your work. But Mike uh, um, is working with indigenous young people. And as by way of introduction, I don't think any of you would be surprised to know that indigenous peoples in all parts of the world bear a very disproportionate burden of mental health problems. Uh, I have not myself worked in Canada, but I worked a lot in Australia where the Aboriginal people, uh, especially young Aboriginal people, fa uh, uh, bear a huge burden of uh, suicide, substance use, self-harm, violence, etc. Uh, and we'd be looking forward to hearing uh, from Mike about his experience with Indigenous Canadians and how the system is responding to those needs. Uh, following on from Mike, uh, we'll, have, we'll have the great pleasure of, uh, I'm going to make sure I get the full name, Saima Hussain. Uh, Saima is uh, originally from Bangladesh, through via Canada and now Abu Dhabi, so a very global citizen. Um, but I know Saima's work mainly because uh, uh, she works with children with developmental disabilities. And I was asking her, isn't that a very particular form of vulnerability? That is to say, these children become adolescents with their own uh, needs, sexual and reproductive, as well as mental health needs. And how do adolescents with developmental disabilities uh, um, address these needs, and how well does the system cope with that? So we're going to first start with Mike and then follow on uh, uh, with Saima. And I'm going to ask both of you uh, to first just say a few words about yourselves and uh, uh, what you do, and then elaborate on the particular subject of the vulnerabilities that you work with with young people uh, and how it relates to mental health. Because we have only two panelists, we also have hopefully plenty of time for questions, and I know many of you here are working with young people and mental health, especially in vulnerable contexts, and so I'm going to really invite those of you uh, who would like to share a few words about your own work to also feel free to do so. So, Mike, let's start with you. Sure. It's, it's great to see you virtually. Um, I have to say I'm a power this morning where I live, so um, there's no power from the town, so it's a bit... It was a bit uh, challenging to get some of the uh, the IT equipment. I'm, I'm glad that um, I'm able to uh, to join you all here and thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I am working at, at, at the, a town called Sioux Lookout. Um, Sioux Lookout is about 500 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. So to kind of um, orient you a little bit, so where you are in Ottawa right now, we're, I'm about 2,000 kilometers northwest of you. Um, 
um, 2,000 kilometers north uh, west of you. And the Sioux Lookout Zone actually covers a fairly large area. So it's, it covers an area about the size of Germany and France, right? So it goes all the way up to Hudson's Bay and then all the way um, west towards the Manitoba um, um, Manitoba border. Um, and within the Sioux Lookout Zone, um, our, our practice um, covers a number of uh, uh, of, of Indigenous communities. Um, for me, sharing stories and, 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 and truth-telling is, is an essential part of reconciliation, you know? And, uh, and for me, reconciliation is really a, it's a seed, right? It's a seed that um, will bear the fruits of, of justice, fairness, equity, and equality. And truth-telling to me is, a, is an important part of reconciliation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear witness to that truth. I really had something else Plan. But it's amazing. You, you sometimes have patient clinical encounters, um, and, and the best teachers are our patients, and they inform. Um, um, they can. In, they. They. they we, we. We learn from them. You know. So I just want to share with you a clinical encounter that I. That I. That I had. Uh, um, when I was on in the emergency uh, emergency department, just to describe the situation as it relates to youth mental health, right, in our region and access to youth mental health. And um, so I was on, uh, um, um, I was on working in our, our local hospital, um, um, a young um, uh, a woman, a, a, a preteen young woman came down. Um, um, this was her fifth suicide attempt in the last four months. Um, just to orient you a little bit of, of the of the situation. So this was her fifth suicide attempt in the last uh, in the last four months. Um, I'm using Tylenol uh, um, this time, um, a Tylenol overdose. Um, um, she's had previous attempts um, um, by hanging um, as well as with uh, with ibuprofen. Um, um, very little access to mental health. Um, she's actually um, in the child protective system. So she's, just to, to orient you a little bit, she's been in three placements in the last seven years. Uh, um, throughout, her, throughout her life, if you go back through her chart, because her chart tells a story, right? Her chart tells her story of her interfacing with the healthcare system, right? And interfacing with the child protection, uh, the, the interfacing with the child uh, protection protection uh, system. Um, her attempts, go back through her chart a number of years for to get her speech language pathology assessments, to get her occupational language uh, uh, um, assessments. Uh, those assessments were denied. Um, she was, she was, um, uh, uh, assessments were requested for mental health supports. Those assessments as well were, were, were denied. Sometimes, um, she was able to access while you go through her chart and you're, 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 you're reading a little bit about, about her. Um, some, she was able to access some services as far as her mental health, but she moved. So the service could not get coordinated for where she was. And sometimes she was moving in the federal system, and then sometimes she would interface with the provincial system and 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 and, and move with the child protective system that operates uh, provincially or so. Uh, um, even to access a hearing test, uh, she was born a number of years ago, right? Um, that was that was unfortunately uncovered, right? And she likely had a a hearing deficit that was uh, that was not um, uh, that was not uh, picked up. Um, there's been previous stories of um, going back through her chart again about concerns about sexual abuse, um, concerns about um, uh, her 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 family, um, 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 our residential school survivors. Right. Um, so when I when I'm in the emergency department, you have to uh, tell you a story, right? And when you go back through their chart, you. To appraise yourself of what that story is. So when I when I look at at a young girl, a number of suicide attempts, interface with the child protective system, um, had developmental and child developmental concerns um, that could not be addressed. Constantly moving, constantly moving in terms of their in terms of their parental uh, in terms of their parental uh, in terms of their parental uh, uh, um, um, situation. Uh, what is what are some of the conclusions that I can draw when I look at this child when I look currently look at this child's mental health and it's really what I've been able to draw is that continual colonization can really kill children a colonized mindset can cause extreme harm to children right this is not about individual people at a government level there are very very good people that work at governments but the problem is, is that what is the what was what are the mindsets that are important, that are informing the value system? What are the mindsets that are because we recognize in healthcare and to 
better health outcomes and youth mental health outcomes are, are, are part of that. You need more than good intentions to produce good outcomes. You need to focus on things like, like quality. And we know that good people can exist within a colonial system and still perpetuate that system's harm. I exist within that system. And I, I, I exist within that system. And, and I can perpetuate harm within that system. So what do we actually need? And, and we understand in Canada that we, that we have a system that, that is, for a very long time, system, systemized denial of health care based on raised children. And what do you do in that environment is that you have to transform the value system, right? Transformation for me, healthcare transformation, is not, a, is not merely a policy option. It's a necessary solution. It's a necessary solution to improve patient um, uh, um, um, outcomes. And we think that colonial system, colonial mindsets can cause tremendous degrees of harm towards uh, 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 um, children. If you look at the Indigenous healthcare system, it's a dizzying array of, of, of transportation frameworks, of, of uh, you know, contribution agreements, but these are not systems. These do not function as a healthcare system. Right? And you can have systems that are focused on not necessarily providing care, but 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 in systematically denying care. Right? Uh, we have to go beyond, in my opinion, sort of isolated interventions. Right? Um, ascribing to the system that we call incremental change, just tweaking a system that is not working, that's based on a value system that is wrong. Right? And we need to go. We need to go. And, and, and use the principles that we see in other systems, right? For example, if I look at, at, at revolutionary ideas, um, see that in, in fields such as healthcare quality, right? We're in a quality revolution. That wasn't in medicine 50 years ago, right? Because we know that we can improve health by, by focusing on quality. Where is that in the indigenous healthcare system? We see, for example, um, um, healthcare revolutions such as um, patient-centered, right? Patient-centered medical home. These are healthcare re revolutions that that have that have taken hold of healthcare systems in the last number of years. Where are these tenants in the digital health system? You know, these, these these are not there. We always say that is the system broken? People always say that the system is broken. The system is broken. I don't believe the system is broken. I believe the system is actually doing very well what its original mandate was. That's the problem. The system isn't broken. The system is doing what it was originally intended to do very well and stuff. You know, children are not going to thrive in environments where we value outputs and not outcomes. They don't thrive in those environments. Their mental health will not thrive in those uh, environments. And that, and I believe in fundamental system transformation. That's going to be the only way forward to improve health outcomes, to move from a colonial mindset where our value system is being informed by colonial values and shifting that and transforming that entirely and rejecting the premise of incremental change to a indigenous patient-centered value system where patients are at the focus. And, and that is where I think the, uh, the, the, the step forwards are going to happen. And, and we see this in the news all the time, you know. What do we think is going to happen when we have Indigenous children in this country that consistently find themselves in front of the sharp end of inequity? What do we think is going to happen? Indigenous education system is underfunded. The education system um, has built-in supports for mental health. We don't have any of that where I work. The child protection system, part of the funding can go to support parents when they're struggling. We don't have access to any of that. We do not have access to any of that. The healthcare system is underfunded and needs to be fundamentally transformed. So if you have healthcare system, if you have the educational system, if you have the child protection system that is underfunded, and needs transformation, what outcomes, what fruit do we think are gonna, we're going to bear? And that's why Indigenous children consistently find themselves in front of the sharp end of inequity. 
So, uh, you know, I truly believe that we need to have fundamental system uh, system transformation and, and transition from a, a, a colonial mindset to an indigenous patient-centered mindset. That's what reconciliation is about. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was an incredibly powerful presentation, Mike, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions. Uh, but I'm going to just hold off questions until we've heard now from our, uh, a second panelist. Uh, uh, Saima, you've been working in a very different context uh, uh, and with a very different group of vulnerabilities. And we'd love to hear now a little bit about your work and particularly around the area of disabilities in young people as well. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Dr. Patel, and uh, great hearing from you, uh, Mike. And uh, some of what I'm going to say is really going to resonate with you because uh, the very particular vulnerable group that I've been working with the last few years has been the Developmental Disabilities Group. And the reason I, I did that is although our government uh, was very supportive of disabilities in general, the methodology the implementation of the support was done in, in a very traditional manner. And we had a Ministry of Social Welfare that looked at rights, there were stipends and such. What was not provided was uh, services through the health sector, even simple things as identification within the health system. Um, it was very uh, sort of disparate, very separate, and it didn't reach out to all of the population. And then when you talk about the adolescent population, there was no service, uh, no acknowledgement of what their needs may be and uh, how to support them. So there was no linkages between the Ministry of Social Welfare that is, uh, uh, you know, Ensured, uh, supposed to ensure their rights and the education system, the health system, uh, labor and employment and training system. So what we started doing, we started with, uh, uh, my work started in 2010 with raising awareness. We had an international conference. It brought to the forefront. And in particular, I took the most complex uh, issue of autism. Now, at that time, autism was un unrecognized. It wasn't uh, in our vocabulary. We don't have a word for it. So took a very complex issue, uh, and we started awareness with that. We developed, in 2012, a multi-ministry steering committee. Ministries that were unrelated to, um, n not used to working with disability, they did not really understand what they had to do with disability at all, particularly even uh, something like developmental disorders. They were brought together and uh, we had eight ministries, now we have 14. And what we talked about then is how and what services and supports this population would need. What would uh, children with uh, developmental this disabilities? This is Bangladesh. You this is, I'm, I'm talking about Bangladesh, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't just talk in, uh, from the point of Bangladesh. We also worked on policy change. Because y you want, if you want ultimate service changes, you have to address the needs within the po uh, policy. What is the policies that are preventing the implementation of a more comprehensive and coordinated program. So, uh, you know, we had, I advocated for the resolutions for autism at the UN. We had the resolution on autism at uh, the World Health Assembly. And that has had a significant impact on the, for the children's group. So, early identification, early intervention. And we have made substantial uh, change in the approach to services for this population. Now, when you talk about the adolescent group, they are still extremely vulnerable. And so, actually, Dr. Patel, when you mentioned that I talk about the vulnerabilities of this population, it was a very challenging uh, matter for me because we're still trying to figure out what to do. We have not thought about it. Um, what has happened, I mean, when you talk about developmental disabilities, you have um, schools until the school age, you have you know, government schools, a few of them, but more private schools. But after a certain age group, they don't provide and meet the needs of this population, okay? You have early interventions, you know, primary school uh, teachings. But what happens when they are getting a little bit older? Their needs are changing. They may have something like autism. They have the, uh, much more severity, but perhaps they've made some recovery. They are able to access education, but they're not, because their education cannot be met in these sort of uh, centers and schools. They need to be mainstreamed, because 
their abilities are stronger at that adolescent age group than they were in the early years. And that there is no provision for that. And then when you talk about sexual health, you know, the Bengali culture is such that you know, marriage, arranged marriages are very common, and marriage is an expectation. Then parents are faced with these children who they look, they are now young adults and adolescents, but they're still treated as children, and in many ways, they are behaving as children. When mothers are still, they've just figured out how to toilet train them, they're now trying to figure out how to uh, f uh, help a girl uh, uh, deal with her periods. How is she, how to teach that? So we're right at that cusp where we're st trying to train the mothers, the parents, on how to talk about it, how to educate them, how to teach their young adolescents about their own sexuality. Because as in your presentation you talked about, you, the brain develops in different uh, ways, different aspects develop differently. So a child may not know how to communicate, they may not know how to learn, but that doesn't mean their, their sexual interest isn't developing. So when they're at that age, they are interested in the opposite sex. They want to in, engage, they may not know how, and we also don't really know how to teach them and support them so that they are safe. And this increases their vulnerability because physically they are developed and then they're prone to uh, sexual violence and abuse, sometimes within the, uh, within the families, in the communities. And how do you protect them? How do you teach them? Because, and how, if they have been victimized, do they communicate because they cannot? One of uh, the common practices in, uh, in our cultures in Bangladesh is that uh, you, know, w you provide for a spouse. So um, you will find an arranged marriage is common and you provide for a spouse that will take care of them. So that has its own complications later on. How are they going to be as a parent? as a parent because that's going to rise to children. The parent is thinking of finding a spouse because that will be somebody that will take care of their uh, loved one as they grow older and they may not be able to do it. However, what happens when this person, this young man or woman is a parent themselves? In a, you know, mothers at the end of the day are the primary caregiver. If the mother has a developmental disability, has into lower intellectual functioning, what is her capacity to support her child, teach them the things that they need, protect them the way they need to do? So uh, a lot of our work has been in, you know, changing the policy, changing the uh, understanding and developing programs, but. Uh, the challenge of uh, adolescents with uh, disabilities and developmental disabilities in particular have been extremely uh, difficult to address comprehensively. And this is a conversation we are having right at this point. Uh, the other big challenge is finding a way for them to be productive, to be useful. All of us needs to feel part of the community. And when the stigma was so severe for disability, I mean, for developmental disabilities. Now, for a lot of physical uh, disability, we've had made some progress within uh, Bangladesh, and you know, increasing accessibility and such. However, for this population, there wasn't. And they have, after they've finished school, they have been at home. They are isolated. They are not part of the society, and um, they really have no outlets. So then, that increases their, uh, you know, mental health issues because they are now, you know, experiencing a lot of depression, and um, there is no support for them, no comprehensive programs for them. So at this point, we're one of our my foundation's work is developing. Um, opportunities for them to access training and skill development. Because even at the school age group, at, at their special schools, they will learn certain things, but you know, uh, very basic sort of work. Maybe there's some painting, there's art, there's candle making. That's as far as it goes. But it doesn't make them uh, ready for, to be employed in any way. They're not learning those skills, and that's not part of their curriculum. So you've got this group that could potentially be working, but haven't received the training. And now we have 
you know, uh, shifted the uh, attitude and approach where people are willing to hire them, but we can't really send them to the workplace because there are many other reasons that we have. They're not uh, well prepared to be in, uh, to work. They're not, they don't have the basic skills that they've been taught. So there are certain pockets of work that has happened. We ha have a couple of um, centers that we work with that they're doing different sort of skill development training. They do educational sexual development with these young adolescents, as well, but you have to do it in a different manner. You have to train the parents, work with the parents first, because when parents are looking at, at that, their adolescents, they're thinking of, of them as children. They're looking at their intellectual ability as being that of a child, so they don't want to talk about their uh, sexual health and such. So uh, that, I think that's a quick summary of, okay. of, what, of the different things. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Saima. Um, uh, we have about 20 minutes, uh, okay. and uh, what I'm proposing we'll do is that we invite comments from the audience. Um, as I said, I'm pretty sure there are people here who have had experience of working with young people with various forms of vulnerabilities. I want to highlight two kinds of vulnerabilities we've heard so far, so it would be helpful for you to also maybe reflect on those vulnerabilities in addition to any others you would like to talk about. I thought Mike has uh, you know, really uh, spoken to, I think, uh, a kind of vulnerability that you see across the world, uh, um, and especially in those countries in which the indigenous peoples are living marginalized lives which is in fact true of many countries in the world. Um, and Mike, I was particularly intrigued, uh, and perhaps I'm going to suggest that you both hold on to your some of the questions that we hear or comments and then reply uh, uh, it together. Um, I was particularly intrigued by some of the words you use, which I think are very resonant to some of the writings I've heard about indigenous peoples. You use the word continued colonization, truth-telling, um, and, I, and I think these are quite, quite provocative and important uh, uh, concepts, and I wondered whether you could reflect on how you can balance an individual approach uh, to uh, dealing with these sorts of mental health problems in the context of what you described at, as a dislocation of an entire community uh, from, for example, uh, their, their basic fundamental political rights. So I want you to just reflect on that, and I have found that a very great struggle in my own mind when you have a situation such as the one you described. Should we privilege political action over healthcare action? And I know it's a very naive duality, but nevertheless, to what extent do you, as a healthcare worker, see yourself as a role as a political advocate for the rights of indigenous people? And I think uh, uh, my, my, my question to you, um, uh, uh, Saina, is, Saima, is that I, I think you alluded to this. I've always felt that there, are, there is a caste system that operates within the disability sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and that caste system, and I use a, 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 you know, a framework that I think comes from South Asia, is that people with physical disabilities have achieved far more recognition in terms of their rights to inclusion than people with neurodevelopmental disabilities mm -hmm. have. And I think you really draw on a very important point here about the fact that you may have a neurodevelopmental disability, but you have the same sexual reproductive health desires and therefore needs mm -hmm. uh, uh, as any other young person does. Um, and I think uh, the fact that we have treated people with neurodevelopmental disabilities as asexual mm -hmm. uh, is, is something that I'm, 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 I find deeply disturbing and quite harrowing, actually. And I wondered whether you can reflect on how, how do we as a society respond to these otherwise completely normal needs mm -hmm. in this very, very hidden community? Uh, and to what extent can we ensure uh, access uh, to the appropriate services uh, for, for, for this group? Uh, because I do believe that the mental health issues that young people uh, with developmental disabilities experience tend to be very much within the context of unmet needs for other care. So let's now throw it open to uh, some other questions and comments. Uh, Hi, Mike. My, uh, my question is more geared to Could you just also you. introduce yourself and, uh, yeah. I'm Fatima Ramtula. I'm a gender uh, equality consultant. Um, my question to you is, and I think I'm drawing from some of my, my travels and, and work that I've done recently and, and in the past. And um, so in Canada, I've gone through, you know, communities like Prince 
uh, Prince Albert and North Balford or uh, Moscow, uh, Southern Alberta. Um, and then I'm going globally now where I've worked with, you know, communities in Australia, uh, in the Queens area or, or New Zealand, uh, and then Africa where we've worked with tribals, you know, who are, who are trying to integrate. And from a youth perspective um, and then the elders perspective, I'm wondering when you talk about indigenous patient uh, focused caring, um, when we look at you know simple rituals towards mental health, uh, so in BC, um, integrating proper nutrition so that the community would would uh, you know not face diabetes, or or you know in the northern communities where we're looking at a high rate of uh, suicide and, and alcohol and substance abuse. How are we integrating, um, would you say, the, the actual rituals that, that we have from our elders that are teaching, you know, rituals such as powwows and, and, and the smudging, the art of smudging and, and some of those and integrating and bringing that into our youth's consciousness. Um, what would you think how that can integrate into the, the focused health system for them? Okay, so we have no more questions at the moment. So, Mike, I'm gonna. Oh, sorry, can I? I can't. Oh, sorry, I, I could, the light was blinding me. Yeah. Uh, right. Sorry, yes, please go on. Hi there. My question is quite different, and it pertains to the talk that you gave earlier this afternoon. The big challenge in moving from the MDGs to the SDGs is moving away from this siloed issue-based approach to an integrated model that is also gender transformative, meaning challenging the social and cultural norms and the power relations that's fundamentally at the core. But I was struck by what you said earlier about mental health interventions for in adolescents being low cost and accessible and easily, um, n not necessarily but in a professionalized context. I've seen, uh, this seems to be an area Area that is so uh, so little attention in terms of integrating that into a package. Can you expand more on that? On because for those of us outside of this sector, it would seem that that needs to be very carefully done um, through a very professionalized system. But do you see that that's possible to integrate those sort of mental health supports into projects and bring them to scale? Okay, thanks. Hello, um, man, and my question is to uh, Mike. You said uh, that the system isn't broken. Um, it's doing what it was originally intended to do. So that really speaks to a lot of systemic issues. And I know this is probably a giant question, but on a practical level, what can we do even as, as young people to address these larger systemic uh, issues? Thank you. For my, I yeah, 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 it's okay. Janet Dulate from World Vision Canada. The question is for Mike. What exactly you want to see? What do you want to transform? Okay. All right, I, I think we'll take a, a pause there. And Mike, uh, I'll, I'll invite you to now respond to this batch of questions. <laughs> well, the, so first of all, uh, your question. Um, it, it's very powerful. Uh, when I look at um, the trend in, with the digital people globally. It's, it's I mean, the, the phrase that comes with is born with bias. Okay? We're not born biased, we're born into bias. Right? On either side, of, yeah, either side of the conversation, okay? we're either born into um, um, a stuff that does add us a split, right? And, and, and that, that is the experience that we have Right? Um, um, there's a curriculum operating in the right? as it relates to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I'm just going to check with our sound people whether this is a problem with the sound system or is it a problem with the internet connection? Internet. Uh huh. Uh, is, it, is it not coming through? Now it's better. Or? Mike, maybe, maybe if you speak a little louder, it sometimes helps uh, you know, overcome the internet problem. Okay. It gets slower? And and slower, yeah, maybe a bit louder and a bit slower. That's the request okay, I have here. Yeah. I have a tendency to speak very quickly, so I'll, I'll do my best to slow myself down. So, yeah, is that, is that coming through a bit clearer? Yes, it is. Yeah, 
In, in medicine, we talk about this thing called the hidden curriculum, right? Mm. Um, um, that can sometimes speak louder than the actual articulated curriculum of med school is talking. It's a collection of ideas, right? That's not necessarily articulated, but but that uh, that that learn could potentially take their value system, right? So see in this country, we see that in every country, right? And how do I reconcile when I'm a med school and through matriculation through, through residency? How do I reconcile between a system that states just equality for all and what? on the ground. That that becomes a point that becomes a point where it, it, it's, a, it's a very self-reflective point. Right? Um, and, and it and it, and for me it, it, it is very, very important, right? When you're confronted with what you think you are and then what you actually are. And then I have to realize that how has colonization affected me and my viewpoint? Because I am not immune in all of this. All of my thoughts and my perspective and my feelings and my my views get shaped by the that we've all been steeped in, right? Because colonization is, is not really a very effective, not very effective in that oppressor, it's an extremely effective indoctrinator. So on both sides of colonization, you could be indoctrinated with certain beliefs of certain and another group could be oppressed. So how do I reconcile that position? To, to, to the point from the individual advocacy is, because that can be extremely discouraging, right? You can't look at the system and you can get very discouraged. And it's to understand what, what does colonization try to do? Colonization ultimately so people's hope. So sometimes I literally, and I brought this up before, you have to make a deliberate and intentional decision every single day not to allow population to take away your hope. In the little, in the patient interactions that I have, if we're doing large forms of activity, I cannot allow colonization to take away my hope. Hope in, hope in change being a possibility. Hope in justice, hope in fairness, hope in equity. I cannot allow colonization to take away that belief that pain is impossible, whether it's in, at, on an individual patient level or whether it's on a system level. So these are all these are all internal points of, uh, of, of reflection, right? How we deal about these, we look at these art cues, um, but we also have to make them real on a very personal level, right? How have I been impacted by colonization? I have views that are colonizing. How can I go of understanding and appreciating what my true condition is? That's a very self reflective exercise. We have to get personal with the issues of reconciliation has to be real to us on a level before it becomes systemic. And, and whether it's a clinical encounter or whether it's larger forms of advocacy, it needs to be real. It needs to get real to us. It needs to be on a granular, real level to us. So when I when I when I look at other times, and be discouraged, you keep yourself as, as as part of this, and maybe vicariously complicit in some of the harm that you're seeing being perpetuated, because you're part of that system. So reconciliation has to be real on the individual level, and it has to be an extremely personal thing. And we have to understand what our condition is, that we can experience a condition in our value systems. In to the question of what do I want to see the system look like? I want to see a system that has indigenous values at its core. A system that is not holistic centered, but is patient centered and community centered. A system that 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 that's fault. A system that is a system that is going to start off instead of saying who's going to pay and and how are we, but going to look put the child at the center and say how are we going to get happen what needs to happen. Let's focus on outcomes. 
and, and, and focus on having people and not just doing things. So for me, system change fundamentally starts at realizing that this current system has been shaped by colonial groups. We need to reject the premise of incremental change and embrace the idea of changing the value of the system. To things like justice, care, health, equity. And part of that relates to the other issue too, valuing, valuing indigenous knowledge. That has to be real in the healthcare system. And my concern sometimes is that we don't put it on the same par as some of the other elements of our healthcare system, and it needs to be. Because those elements are extremely, extremely important. And sometimes, if we do things in healthcare, sometimes we can perpetuate more. I found situations where we're sending children out and we're sending them thousands of kilometers away to get like a trip. I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm, you know, we're form one in them. We're, we're, we're doing all of these, all of the interventions that we were taught in medical school. And at the top of those you know, because we're thinking in a line that reduces the heart. And then that child, speak to that child in the hospital and say, I feel isolated, I feel hurt, I feel disconnected from my culture. And then, and then you have that realization that did I continue cultural context in the right answer? Medicine is not about content, it's also about context. And the answer in the wrong context is not the right answer anymore. And we need to realize that in medicine. How are we incorporating traditional values? How are we incorporating traditional um, 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 knowledge systems into the plan? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Micah. I think we got most of it. Uh, there were times in which uh, you, you disconnected, but I think we could string together the gaps. Um, so thank you very much for your response. Uh, Saima, over to you. Uh, the, my main question was really about, uh, the, ah, the yes, main question was, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry about that. I got lost in uh, yes. Mike's really powerful message. You know, uh, in, in so many ways, uh, this whole challenge of mental health, you know, having lived in, in Canada and uh, uh, mental health issues and mental health services being sort of linked with how these very vulnerable populations are not receiving the kind of support that they need. And that's definitely the situation in Bangladesh as well. The most vulnerable ones are the ones who don't receive it. Um, as far as um, sexual um, development of uh, youth and the way to address it is really taking a very good hard look at how we are educating the youth. Start teaching the adolescents at a younger age because you are talking about this population that takes a lot, little bit longer to learn. So teaching them over time, educating the caregivers on how to communicate as sexual uh, various uh, stages are reached so that they can um, learn to protect themselves more. So educating the caregivers first and giving them the resources so that they can teach their young ones and creating a support system within the community so that the families are already isolated. When you have a child with a disability, you are extremely isolated. And uh, you know, this isn't any different from the situation in Canada for a family in Bangladesh, for a family in India, or in um, family in the, the uh, where Mike is. So that isolation can happen regardless of where you are, but your, uh, your increased vulnerability, the challenges that you have isolates you even further. And uh, you know, sexuality and sexual development is something that we hesitate to talk about, and particular, we hesitate to talk about with this population. So having clear guidelines on how we, that can be taught and bringing the community together is what's needed. Yeah, so I'm just reminded you know, of a very harrowing case in India last year, which you may have heard about, of a 16-year-old girl whose parents wanted her 
uh, to have a, um, uh, a, a sterilization surgery mm -hmm. because she had intellectual disability yeah. and felt that she was in, at risk. It was a very, very compassionate request, yeah. actually. It was of parents who were fearful of her well-being yeah. uh, and how the system was completely unprepared to address this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I can't imagine the number of times this must happen in the lives of families with a child with a disability, a developmental disability, mm -hmm. as that child um, reaches adolescence. And I can still remember hiring encounters with parents who often say, what will I do when I'm gone? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a really huge question, actually, for global adolescent health. Uh, what is the system in place for the long-term welfare mm -hmm. of uh, children born with developmental disabilities as they grow into adolescence and young adulthood, particularly as families are no longer able to cope with the long-term caring uh, in, uh, you know, uh, resilience that they used to have mm -hmm. in a very different context? Yeah. Um, there was one question particularly for me, and I'll just quickly answer that. So uh, in response, Probably one of the most exciting developments in the field of global mental health ha has been the evidence base around the use of frontline workers to deliver psychological therapies. Um, uh, for those of you who want to see something more about this, uh, you can look at the latest issue, for example, of the annual review of clinical psychology just published uh, last week, um, which documents uh, 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 nearly 30 randomized controlled trials uh, for adults with uh, 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 mood and anxiety conditions. Many of those trials would include adolescents, older adolescents, like 18 and 19 years old. Um, the evidence base for adolescence is mostly from the developed world, but I don't see any reason why that can't be translated to the developing world, um, particularly around the use of self-guided self-care. Uh, there's a very exciting new evidence base around digital apps. Uh, we all know that those have limits in some parts of the world, but the world is changing very fast, and I, I, I think they have a lot of promise uh, for the future, as well as the use of teachers and peers as counselors with appropriate training and supervision. But I'm happy to share uh, that with you uh, uh, afterwards. So we've got a few more minutes, uh, maybe a couple of minutes uh, left, and I wondered whether anyone wanted to have any final, oh yes, David, yes, please. Hi, David Ross from the World Health Organization in Geneva, working on adolescent health there. And I, my particular question is for Saima um, about what sort of, do we, what, what information do we have about the, the numbers of kids, uh, of adolescents in particular, with um, developmental disorders? And given that they're often very, very hidden, um, how do we best find them um, to provide services or should we not be finding them but just be very youth friendly and adolescent friendly and disability friendly and hence people coming to us or a combination of the two? Actually, it's interesting you asked me that question because I'm faced with a, a, a program that I wanted to get started and I didn't, that's exactly the question I didn't have. So about a year ago, uh, we worked with our garments industry, a leather industry, and our, my foundation actually signed um, agreements with them because they agreed to employ um, you know, youth with um, neurodevelopmental disorders. And what they wanted to do, you know, coming from the corporate sector, they wanted the numbers. They wanted to know how many they could train, how many they were going to employ. And we didn't know where to find them. <laughs> because the system is as such that it's set up to meet the needs of children, to provide education for children. When they are about 15 years of age, they do, those children do not want to go to these schools anymore. So they are sitting at home. And so one of the ways, really, you have to go out into the community, look at not just the larger schools, because we don't have those numbers. We don't have a record of them. Um, so you have to go to the smaller centers, smaller schools, and communicate with them. Because the only contact these families have are with their former teachers, maybe the former principals. And they may know, OK, this person is there. And we really have to work very hard on getting the numbers. Um, the other thing that happens is when you talk about the higher functioning um, uh, developmentally disabled uh, youth, the, the parents have worked very hard so that they fit in better with a larger society. So they tend not to come out and say that, yes, our child had a disability or has a disability. Because you want them to fit in with the severe discrimination and stigma that's associated with it. You want them to be successful. So 
you know, but they are the role models. They are the ones who can actually uh, show us what support is needed. So I'd love to be able to tell you this is the way to, uh, you know, get the way, what the numbers are or how to get them. But the only way that I see that we can do it is getting in touch and developing this network. And one of the biggest challenge uh, for the whole disability sector is that we tend to work in silos. We tend to be so protective of the needs of our particular disability group that we don't want to communicate with, with the others or we don't want to share our resources. And that's not just in a country, that's internationally. We are not sharing the resources and we have to really kind of come together in this sort of partnerships and find the numbers because if we, are not, we don't develop a model of working that is a bit, a bit more integrated, we are continuing to um, isolate them, we are continuing to make them much more vulnerable and it is going to lead to much more significant mental health issues because the, when you're isolated, when you don't have opportunities and you don't have uh, we, we, we as human beings want to participate. We ha all of us have a need to feel uh, important, need to feel like we're contributing in some way, that we belong in this world global community somehow. And when you're isolated, when you're left behind, whether it be in, um, uh, where, you know, in, in a certain community that started off thinking we're protecting them and putting them in that community or in a little center or at home, you're still isolated. You're not part of the larger whole. Your needs aren't being addressed and aren't met. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sure you'll join me all in uh, thanking both our panelists for this wonderful session. And uh, I'm afraid we'll run out of time, but I'm sure you can catch up with Saima over the lunch break. I'm sorry, I'm being given an indication we re really do have to wrap up. So thank you both very much, Mike and Saima, uh, and thank you all for coming thank and having you. such a great discussion.